Awesome. Well, thanks for having us today. It's an honor to be here on the stage. And I just want to say welcome to all those who are watching back in Tabor. We have a great team there, like Pastor El shared, and Martin and Margie are hosting our service in Tabor today. So welcome to everyone in Tabor. Welcome to everyone joining us in Claire's home with Pastor Brian and Pastor Heidi. Welcome to you. Welcome to everyone in Okotoks with Pastor Joel and Tanisha. We um, we love our team of campus pastors. We hang out with them often and we get to do life together and we couldn't do this without them. And Pastor Mike and Kara and Lloyd Minster, welcome to all of you guys. Welcome to Lethbridge with Pastor Ralph and Cindy and anyone joining online. Again, it's just... An honor to be here. Pastor Jen and Tim do an awesome job with the online campus, and we get to do this together. We are one church in multiple locations, and we love serving God in our community, and we just love seeing what He is doing in our province and across this nation. We are in a series called This Is My Happy Place, and you might have guessed my happy place is the golf course. And I can tell you that is not everybody's happy place. Even those who say it is, because I go on that golf course and I hear all sorts of language from people who are supposed to be enjoying their time there, but don't always do. And I didn't always love golf. Actually, at one point when I was younger, I actually kind of despised it because when I was Hudson's age, Hudson's 15, he's my son. I'd get home from church on a Sunday and turn on the TV hoping to watch, you know, a good movie or something. And like golf was on like almost every channel. I'd flip through the channels, all the network channels was golf and I just didn't get it. But then something changed. When I went to school in the 1900s, yeah, you laugh, okay, but, but I'm still a teacher. And uh, I walk, I work at a K to eight school And sometimes I'll be walking down the hallway and a little kindergarten kid will say, Mr. A, can I talk to you? So I I kneel down and I talk to them and I'm like, what do you need to share? My mommy and daddy went to school in the 1900s, they'd say. (laughs) So if you're like, if you went to preschool or kindergarten, if you're like 26, 27 and older, that's how kids talk about us these days. But back in the 1900s, this guy showed up on the golf course and revolutionized the game. His name is Tiger Woods. And in 1997, he won a tournament called the Masters and became famous for that. And people started dressing like this guy. People started showing up on the golf course. They started using the same equipment he was using. And he inspired a lot of people, like myself, to try golf. It looks easy, but golf was hard. If you've ever tried it, you know what I mean. So... I went out to the golf course for the first time. I was in grade 12, and it was with our Phys Ed 30 class, and we were just at the driving range. And I put that ball down, the very first one, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be like Tiger Woods, and I'm gonna hit this ball far and straight. My first swing, I totally missed the ball. And it kind of surprised me. I was like, what? This looks so easy. How can this be? So I put another ball down. I kind of it went like two feet, hit another one. You know those things that separate the, the, um, the driving range boxes? It went off like that wall and went backwards or sideways. Like, I don't know where it went. It, it was terrible. But the kid beside me, who was the same age, was hitting them long and straight every single time. I'm like, how do you do that? Like, how do you make it look so easy? And he said to me, I've been golfing with my dad since I was a little kid. And so he had taken lessons. He had spent a lot of time out on that course. And he had practiced, practiced, practiced. And he eventually got fairly good at the game. If you've been around Parallel Church for a while, or maybe it's your first time, we talk about a discipleship process. And we did a series on it called The Table. Who remembers the series on The Table? Okay, most of you. So it's based on this verse from 1 John 2. 12 to 13, it says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. A lot of times when we share um, the discipleship process using that verse, we're talking about people in the New Testament, people who walked alongside Jesus, people like Peter, who Jesus said, follow me, and he really had no idea who Jesus was besides that he was a teacher, but the more 
Peter walked alongside Jesus. He recognized he was God. He recognized there was something special about this guy. And when Jesus went to heaven, Peter was still here, and he was able to teach some of the same things Jesus taught. I want to connect what we're talking about today, the, this idea of we always need to keep learning, to a, test, a story from the Old Testament, a story about David. And David was someone who was, uh, he's well known, even to this day. When I say David and Goliath, even if you've never been to church before, you've probably heard that story. We're first introduced to David in 1 Samuel 16, 6. And this is a longer uh, verse, but I'll just read it all out here. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's to be important as we continue today. The Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesus called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel, but Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one. Jesse then had Shammah pass, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There was still the youngest, and Jesse answered, he is tending to the sheep. Samuel said, send for him, for we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise up and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. There is something special and unique about David from a very young age. He was anointed, and before he went out into the world, did all these amazing things, his relationship was, with God was growing stronger and stronger all the time. Tiger Woods, at a young age, had a lot of talent. And he had to invest in that talent to get to where he got professionally. It took a lot of hours on that golf. I love to golf, but there's no way I've hit anywhere near the amount of golf balls Tiger Woods has ever hit in his life. And even though he had talent, he still had to develop that talent. And he did. And people began dressing like him. They began using the same equipment he did. It became a billion dollar industry. David, once he was anointed, went back to the farm. He kept doing what he was called to do at that time. But then an opportunity came up. And Israel was at war. And there was this giant named Goliath who was calling out and mocking God's people. And David said, hey, aren't we going to do something about this? And he wanted to do something, but he was told at the time, no, it's not your job, just sit down, we'll take care of it. But he kept on saying, hey, I want to do something. I feel like I'm supposed to do something. And remember, the Spirit of the Lord was powerfully upon him, and so people listened. The king listened and gave David the opportunity. And what did he do? He went and faced the giant and killed the giant, and had a major victory that day for Israel. But his story didn't stop there. In 1 Samuel 18.5, we hear more of what David's doing. It says, whatever mission Saul sent him on, and Saul is the king at the time, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. So David is getting into the young man stage of his discipleship journey here. He is able to go out, and everywhere he goes, he's working hard, he's building friendships, he's building relationships, and he's having success wherever he goes. He's getting things done. Why? Because he's putting the time and the effort into it. He's connecting with the right people. But more importantly, the Spirit of God is with him, and he's having this desire to never stop learning. David, throughout his whole life, had this desire to learn more about God, more about other people, and it kept showing over and over and over again, and it was being recognized. 
I was out on the golf course one time after I started golfing and I was not having a very good round. I was, for those that golf, it was like double bogey, triple bogey, and that's not a good thing. And I get to the next hole and it was a busy day on the golf course and there's these like four little kids ahead of me. Like, they were like this tall and they would turn around and they would say to me once we got to the next hole waiting for the next people to tee off so that they, or clear the course so that they could tee off. They asked me my score and I would tell them and They'd be like, oh yeah, cool. We got a par, we got a birdie. And there's these little kids, those are good things, by the way, for the people who aren't golfers. So these, these little kids are telling me they're better than me. <laughs> and I was like, kind of annoying. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. But again, they had already put in that time and practice. Yes, were they um, maybe naturally gifted? But yes, they were putting the time out there to get better. In 2 Samuel 8, 13 to 14, it says this. And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Whenever I read my Bible, I say a quick little prayer first. I say, God, just reveal something new to me. Show me something new in your word today. And this, is, this verse here is just like, and David became famous after he turned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Like, it's a little history lesson, but I stopped on two words. And I'd never read this before, and I'd never seen it this way. David became famous, became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites. This is years after he killed a bear, years after he killed a lion, years after he killed Goliath. This is years after he married the king's daughter and had victory wherever he went. He became famous in his time when he struck down 18,000 Edomites. And I had to pause there because I think so many times we're saying to ourselves, if only, if, I, if only I get this promotion, if only I can, you know, pass, you know, this university program, then I'll be where God wants me to be, and that's when I'll, I'll have everything I want. If only I could, you know, you know, meet the right person and get married and have kids, then, you know, that's when I'll have everything I've ever wanted. David, in his time, became famous for something that we don't really talk about much today. We know him as the guy who faced Goliath and faced that giant and won so there's something about God's timing that we need to realize that God is always with us. He's walking alongside us no matter what situation we're facing. And if we're always looking for the next thing and not worried about what we're dealing with today, we might miss out on something pretty important because down the road, people might not even remember you for what you were trying to accomplish. So again, when you read God's word, I encourage you, let the Holy Spirit direct you in that and try to pick out those new things every day. Learn something new every time you read his word. From 2000 to 2010, Tiger Woods dominated golf. If you look up his records, you'll see like it's unmatched. Even today, there's great golfers out there, but nothing compares, especially to the 2000 season. I mean, what Tiger Woods did was just absolutely phenomenal. It took me a long time to get into what I would say is the father's stage of golfing. When we're talking about the father's stage, that's where you can teach others what you've learned. And in the discipleship process, that's what the father's stage is. You know, you've learned a lot and then you can share that with others. I was a very impatient golfer when I first started. There was one story where I was out golfing and I thought I had it all together. I was... Um, out on this course by myself. There was no one else out there. And the first three holes, I was doing really well. And I had uh, my three wood out. And the first three holes, I was even par. And that's a good thing for golfers out there. <laughs> that's a, or for people who aren't golfers, uh, even par is a good thing. So I was through the first three holes. It only took me 12 shots. And I thought, I got this figured out. But then I got to the next hole and I put a ball in the tee and I took a swing and the ball went off to the right into the bushes. 
And that's a penalty shot, so right away my score is not so good. And I, I was patient with myself, and I thought, okay, well, the next shot will be better. So I put another ball down, same swing, ball goes into the woods. I'm like, oh, well, that's annoying. I did it again, same thing, into the woods. Then I was getting frustrated and angry and probably used some language that I shouldn't have, if I'm being honest. And again, and again, and again, I don't know how many times I put a ball into those trees, and I got so frustrated. Have you guys seen that movie, Braveheart? I think most people probably have. At the end, there's a guy named Hamish who, uh, the last battle, he grabs his sword and he, someone, I think maybe yells freedom and there's like the Scottish music playing and he hucks that sword and it goes flying across the field and <laughs> sticks into the ground. Well, yeah, that was me with my golf club, but it went further than that sword did. I, I brought this club so far back, and I chucked that thing as far as I could have. If I was in Lloyd Minster, it would have been into the next province. If I was in Claire's home, it would have been on the other side of town. Like, it went far, and I watched that thing sailing through the air. And as it was going, I was like, oh, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. But I thought I was on the course by myself, and out of nowhere, this guy is walking up the other fairway, walking right towards my club. And I don't know where he came from. I didn't see anyone else out there. And this club is twirling, right? And it lands right at his feet. And I was so embarrassed. I was embarrassed. My face turned red. I was like, oh no, what a, that, that was a bad idea. And so I, I approach the guy, he grabs my club and he comes up to me and he was actually really nice about it. He's, he said, don't worry, we've all been there. He's like, it's okay to get frustrated. And he showed so much patience with me, but I was embarrassed. I'm like, I need to go get lessons. So the next day I go out to the driving range and I'm, I'm working hard. Like I'm sweating, hitting golf balls and I got blisters on my hand. And there's this older guy next to me and he turns around and he says, you're never gonna be good at golf. I was like, what? <laughs> like, who are, what? what are you talking about? And he said, I'm in my 90s. I used to be a club pro. I used to teach lessons all the time. And he's like, if you don't get some help, you're never going to be good at this game. I was like, what? And he's like, well, they start, and he grabbed my hands like really forcefully and pulled me over. And like, he put my hands on the club and said, this is what you need to do with your grip. And he's like, gave me a few little pointers. He's like, anything else, you have to pay me for lessons. I'm not giving free lessons anymore. And, <laughs> But I learned something that day. I learned that I needed to take lessons. I learned that I had to invest some time in this to get better. And so I did. And there was a season where, you know, I was getting actually decent at the game. Then I'd got married and had kids. I didn't play as much. And I, some of those things I learned kind of faded away. And it was a, a time where like, I love my wife and kids. I love Jill and Hudson and Tanley. They're such amazing support to me in everything I do. And giving up golf for, you know, a lot of golf for a few seasons was the right thing to do. But I got to the point where um, I needed to get better again. And so I took lessons again. And it was a time where, yeah, even though I'd invested a lot of time in this game, I learned something new. And I ended up shooting one of the best rounds in my life. I, got, I reached one of my goals, which was breaking 80. I shot 79 a couple of years ago, which was pretty awesome. Hey, thank you. Hey, I get to say it to the world. But even though I was getting good at the game, there was still more to learn. Tiger Woods, for most of his professional life, was at the top of the world in golf. David was famous for striking down 18,000 Edomites, but people at this time in his life, he is also king and he has everything he could ever want. But in 2 Samuel 11, we hear of a mistake he makes. It says, late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was and he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. At his peak, Tiger Woods had it all. 
billionaire, not just millionaire, billionaire, married to a model, beautiful kids, everything he could have ever wanted, he had. But then the scandal began to come out and uh, the world found out that he was unfaithful. Same thing almost, well, the same thing did happen to David. He had everything he could have ever wanted and yet he messed up. You know, that happens to the best of us. And David, his response to what happened was, I don't know Tiger Woods personally, I wish I did. It'd be nice to go have a round of golf with him. But I do know what was on David's heart because it's recorded in God's word. And he said that he was sorry. He begged for God's forgiveness. He said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And people came around David and supported him. And to this day, he is still known as the, one of the greatest kings ever. Why? Because it comes back to the very beginning of when the Holy Spirit came powerfully upon him. God said he saw David's heart. And David's heart was to always grow closer to God despite his circumstances, despite the things that were causing him pain, despite the choices he made, he still pursued God. He still allowed the Holy Spirit to be with him wherever he went. As a golfer, it's easy to get a, the quick fix, like, oh, I'm not playing well, I'll go buy new clubs or new shoes or a new, new shirt. There's always an excuse to not golfing well. But we need to make sure in our lives that we don't start making all these excuses for the things that are going wrong. Maybe sometimes we just need to get on our knees and come before God and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. I messed up. I, I screwed up. But don't leave me. And the best thing about God's word and his promises are, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So no matter what you've done, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your circumstances are today, God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. In my golf game, I had to, or I wanted to, I didn't have to, I wanted to get better. So even just this last year, I took more lessons. I sent in um, a video to this guy, uh, a coach I met online. Uh, his name is Kevin. Uh, KD Golf is his company, and he's sending these videos, and he analyzes them for you, and he um, gives some feedback and some things to work on. And so I, I sent in my video of my golf swing. It's actually a pretty good swing. It's my seven iron and I hit it. I can still remember it. It was 194 yards right down the middle, like a good swing. It was a, it was a good, it was good. But he analyzed that swing and he said, oh yeah, we need to adjust a few things. And the, the biggest piece of advice he gave me is actually kind of funny. He said, you need to get more parallel. I was like, what? <laughs> more parallel? I got the hat, I got the shirt, I got the church. I guess I need the more parallel golf swing as well. But his advice worked. And it's been kind of a process, though, because as I start to change things, it affects other things, and it creates some new problems, and it's like, reminds me that we can never stop learning. Never stop learning. No matter what you're going through, it's not always going to be easy either. There's going to be things that are hard. When you try to adjust things in your life, there's a process to it, and it can be difficult. But when you stick to it, you will see the results. When we stick to God's plan, you will see the results. Because he's not going to leave you. The last words of David are recorded in 2 Samuel 23. It says this, The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, The one who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is like the light of morning at sunshine like a morning without clouds, like the gleaming of the sun on new grass after rain. They say golf was invented in Scotland or the United Kingdom somewhere a couple hundred years ago, but when I read this, I think David must have been a golfer. The light of morning at some sunrise, like a morning without clouds, like the gleaming of the sun on new grass after rain, like that sounds like a perfect golf day to, to me. But hey, you know what, David, was called to a greater purpose in his life, and he lived out that purpose. He pursued God. Even in his moments of brokenness, what did he do? He pursued God. He got on his knees, 
he worshiped, he prayed, and he did not ever let his past and his mistakes determine his future. And on his deathbed, he could say to God, thank you for being with me. Thank you for everything that you've done for me. Despite his shortcomings, his heart is what made him different. So today's takeaway is this. Every day of your life should be a day where you strive to learn something new. I was out on the golf course a few years ago. It was actually seven years ago this summer with a friend of mine uh, named Justin who uh, loved to golf. And even before I was campus pastor out in Tabor, I always had something on the go. I love being busy. To me, busy isn't a bad word. Like, I, I love doing stuff. I love being out in the community. I love meeting people. I love golf as well. And with him, I just wasn't getting out golfing enough. And I said, I'm busy. I got this to do. I got this to do. And so he, but he kept pursuing me. And he's like, we need to golf. I'm like, and he messaged me one day and said, we are golfing at this time in Tabor. Be there. I'm like, okay, I'm there. And the first nine holes of golf, it was like it always was. It was actually pretty competitive at that time. He was winning a little bit because he liked to cheat, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I knew that, and we always got along. But on the back nine, on hole nine and ten, something changed. And we started talking about who God was in his life. And this is a guy, if you knew Justin, he was a loud mouth. He would say anything to anyone when he was in high school. He would get into fights just for fun. And he was one of those guys who, like, I'm very careful what I say on social media. Very careful. And I always have been. But if I saw something that I would be like, oh, man, I wish I could say this. I would just, like, text Justin and be like, hey, <laughs> this would be funny if you said this. And he'd be like, okay, I'm on it. And, like, 30 seconds later, it would be on Facebook. <laughs> we would laugh about it. But he grew up knowing who God was, but not really knowing God. But something changed right before he got married. And he was driving home one day, and he said, like, the Holy Spirit just came upon him. And he said in, that, in his truck, he prayed that God would be part of his life. In the next few holes, we talked about family. He was married with three beautiful young daughters at the time. And we talked a little bit about, more about who God is and about eternity, things like that. And this is like a big rough and tumble, like oil field guy that we're having this conversation with. In the time we were living close to the golf course and he dropped me off at my house and we said, the last thing I said to him is, hey, we need to get our families together. Like, we need to do this. And he drove away and that's the last time I ever saw Justin. A few days later, I got a phone call from the police department who I was volunteering with at the time and said, Justin passed away. And it was a very difficult time for his family, for his friends. But at least we had the peace knowing that he knew who God was. And there was things that Justin still had to learn in life, but he wasn't given that opportunity. His life was cut short, 33 years old. But if you're here in this room and you're still breathing, there's still things to learn. God still has a plan for you. No matter what stage you're at in that discipleship journey, God wants you to keep pursuing him. He sees your heart. And he wants to know you better. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you that your Holy Spirit is available to each and every one of us. We just pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would come upon us now with the things in life that we struggle with, if there's difficult circumstances we're facing, help us to just turn to you. Let us all know that no matter what, you're walking alongside us. You will never leave us or forsake us. Help us all to have that desire to learn more about you and just to learn many new things with the time that you've blessed us with. In your name we pray, amen. Maybe you're here today for the first time hearing, you know, this discipleship message. And, you know, Jesus came to earth because he wanted to know you personally. Jesus came and he went to the cross. 
And when he hung there on that cross, his heart was for you. He was thinking of you by name. Everyone sitting in this room, in each of our campuses, he was thinking of you. Anyone who's watching online, he was thinking of you. And he willingly gave his life to pay for the mistakes that you couldn't pay for yourself. And Jesus rose again from the dead and he sent his spirit to be with us and he wants to walk alongside you every day of your life. But the beautiful thing is he doesn't force it. He gives us the opportunity to choose to follow him. And so right now here in this room, he is asking you that question. Will you follow me? And that question isn't about, if you say yes to it, it's not about joining a church or religion. It's about starting a personal relationship with him. Would you just bow your heads and say this prayer with me? If it's your first time praying it, just pray it with your whole heart and just say this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God and I believe that you rose again from the dead. I ask you now to become my God, my Lord and my Savior, and my friend. Thank you for dying on the cross and for forgiving me of all my sins. I give my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I just gotta say, you keep your heads bowed just for a moment, but if you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you be bold enough just to acknowledge it by raising your hand as I look around the room? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God is so good. He is so amazing. If you prayed that prayer, there's a team out in our lobby that would love to answer any questions you have. If you have a Bible, they would love to give you one. Can we just stand and worship him one more time and just express to God how thankful we are for everything he's done for us.